We are going back to the book of Esther. Uh, if you were not here with us last week, we kind of did an overview of the book, uh, a very, very broad overview of the book last week. Uh, I'm excited about uh, kind of digging in. I don't know how long we'll be here. Uh, we may, may finish that up uh, kind of before September, but I doubt it. Uh, it just kind of depends on how I end up breaking it up in chunks. But we talked about last week um, just some interesting facts about the book of Esther. It's one of two books of the Bible that does not mention the, the name of God, doesn't no, no specific references to God throughout the whole book. Uh, so that's very interesting. But he is very much the unseen God uh, here in the book of Esther, as you can see from this title. I, I, as I said last week, I borrowed this title from a book by somebody else. I just think it was a very um, an accurate description of what we see, that God's hand is all over this book, even though his name is not found in it. Um, but it's been kind of a perplexing book to the church throughout the ages. I want to just share with you a couple of things uh, from the introduction of this NIV application commentary. And I bring this out for a couple of reasons. Number one, because I didn't have time to type out these quotes, and so I'm going to read from this. But also, just to remind you, if you're ever looking for a commentary on a particular book of the Bible, I would always recommend this series, uh, the NIVAC, uh, stands for New, New, New International Version Application Commentary. So the first part just says it's based, the, the, the print in this commentary is, is of the NIV. Uh, but what I love about this commentary, and it's a whole set, so for most books of the Bible, there's one of these books for that book. Uh, there are some smaller books like uh, Philemon and Colossians that are grouped together. The pastoral epistles are grouped together. Uh, so there's, there's many, many books in this set. What I love about it is there's enough, uh, there's enough digging material that if you want to get into some original words, some Greek and Hebrew, if you want to get into some, some grammar and some verb tenses and that kind of stuff, that's in here in a section called original context or original meaning. Uh, I'm not sure which one it is. Uh, so there's one section that just gives the, uh, what I call the nuts and bolts of the passage. And then there's another section in each passage that gives, it's called bridging the context. And so it talks about how do you, how do you start in the world of the Bible and then end up in today's world? How do you, how do you make that connection? Because we know that the Bible was written to a particular people in a particular time, and we are not those people, and this is not that time, but the message is to us anyway. And so we have to know how to, how to make the connections and how to know what to carry over and what not to carry over. And there's a whole section about that. And then there's a whole section about application. Uh, it's uh, called Contemporary Significance. So if you ever need some help, I would suggest this book. This, this commentary series started my ministry. Uh, when I was teaching youth in Tennessee, before I went to seminary, I taught the book of Acts to my youth group. You don't start in the book of Acts, by the way. You don't start in the book of Acts. Too much weird stuff in the book of Acts. But I didn't know any better, and all I had was my Bible and this commentary. And the Lord just did incredible things. And so uh, I would always recommend it. Uh, some of them are a little bit pricier than others, but you can typically pick one up for about anywhere from $15 to $25, depending on that. But... All that being said, let me read to you some of the quandary of this book that I'm talking about. It says, for the first seven centuries of the Christian church, not one commentary was produced on the book of Esther. So from the first century A.D. all the way through the eighth century A.D., nobody in the church wrote about the book of Esther. Nobody wanted to touch it. Uh, and then some people did less than not touching it. Martin Luther, listen to this. This is what Martin Luther said. Martin Luther said, I am so great an enemy to the second book of the Maccabees and to Esther that I wish they had not come to us at all, for they have too many heathen unnaturalities. Now, I tell you that one for a couple of reasons. Number one, just to, to highlight the controversies of this book. Some controversies, like I've mentioned, that God's name's not mentioned, pagan culture, which is not specifically denounced. Uh, there are a lot of things in the book of Ruth that you're like, what is that about? I mean, the book of Esther. Um, and Martin Luther didn't like that. But I also share that quote with you to remind you 
that none of us are perfect, right? So we have a lot of favorite teachers, favorite Bible preachers that don't get everything right. You got one of them standing in front of you. I don't get everything right. Martin Luther, as much as we love him, as much as we owe to Martin Luther in our spiritual significance with the 500th anniversary of the Reformation coming up in just a, few, just a, just a couple of months, uh, he didn't get everything right. Uh, so it's okay to take the good with the bad when it comes to commentaries and teachers. That is not an acceptable approach when it comes to the Bible. You, you, we cannot do what Martin Luther was doing because Romans tells us, Romans chapter 15, of course we know 2 Timothy 3, 16, which says all Scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for teaching, for correction, for rebuking, and for training in righteousness. And we know, we know beyond any shadow of a doubt that, that Esther belongs in the canon. There's no doubt about that now. The, the church history... Uh, has, has clarified that, and so it is Scripture, and it's profitable for us. I think you're going to see how profitable it is. It's a beautiful story. Uh, much, much to learn in the book of Esther. Uh, but listen to Romans 15, 4. Everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through endurance and the encouragement of the Scriptures, we might have hope. Uh, so that's why we turn to it. So the, the Christian church has not always liked it. As you can imagine, the Jewish synagogue, the rabbis, have a very, very esteemed view of the book of Esther. Uh, it is the story behind one of their two extra-biblical feasts. There are two feasts that the Jewish people continue to observe to this day, which are not in Scripture as we, as we have it. Uh, that would be... Uh, Hanukkah, and the reason that Hanukkah is not in there is because it's one, from one of the uh, apocryphal books, the first and second Maccabees, um, but also the one that is celebrated, well, the one whose story is told in the book of Esther, anybody, <clears throat> anybody know the name of it? Pur, Purim, or Purim, it is the Hebrew, it's the plural of the Hebrew word for lots, the casting of lots. Uh, that we'll read about later in the book. Uh, but this basically tells the story as to why they have that festival, uh, why this was such an important time in the, in the life of the Jewish people. Uh, one of their Jewish rabbis said this about the book of Esther. He said, when Messiah comes, the other books of the Hebrew Bible may pass away, but the Torah, that being the first five books of the Old Testament, and the book of Esther will abide forever. Uh, now, that's not an inerrant statement. He's not the Pope. We are not to take his word, you know, just as his word. But as you can see, you know, just a, there's a very discrepant view of this book, whether you are a Christian or a Jew or an outsider. I, I told you last week, and this is really my uneducated opinion on this, it kind of seems to me like some of this book was intentionally redacted, that maybe... Maybe God's footprint was specifically taken out of it in some obvious ways so that maybe it was more attractive to teach God's providence and God's love and God's faithfulness to people who may not be prepared to hear that in kind of an upfront way. That's a good lesson for us, that sometimes we have to not water down the gospel and not take away the truth, but sometimes we have to be willing to approach things from a different perspective uh, in order to gain an audience with, with those who really don't care for us to say, you know, the Bible says, because their first response is going to be, well, I don't believe the Bible. So it doesn't matter to me what the Bible says. So we've got to be able to teach without some of that language sometimes. And I think there might be some evidence that's involved here in the book of Esther. Uh, just to remind you what we talked about last week, uh, there's a historical context here. It's around 480 BC, so this is post exilic. This is after God's people had been in captivity in Babylon. Uh, so the, the uh, Babylonians came and basically destroyed uh, Jerusalem and, and Judah and, and took many of the citizens back to Babylon for exile, and they were there in exile for many years. And then uh, the, the, the Medo Persians conquered the Babylonians. And there was a king, Cyrus the Great, who decreed in 539 B.C. that the Jewish people could return to their homeland. They could leave Babylon or, or wherever they were, and they could go back to Jerusalem. And some of them chose to do that, but not all of them. In 
fact, lots of them chose either to stay in Babylon because they had gotten comfortable there or just to move a little bit. And so many of them just moved a little bit to Susa, uh, which is where this story takes place. Uh, so geographically, we are in Susa, Persia, which is modern-day Iran, um, and uh, underneath the rule of the Medo-Persian Empire, uh, which was the largest and most powerful empire in the world, not just at that time, but up until that time. So uh, here's a little picture of their uh, empire or their kingdom. Um, there's, there's a verse, the first verse in the book of Esther talks about the Persian Empire uh, going from India to Ethiopia. And in the Bible here, the word, their word India is not our nation India. It's actually Western Pakistan. Uh, you can see that the ending of the green on the right in the screen there where it says India, that would actually be Pakistan in a modern map. And then, of course, Ethiopia would be uh, kind of uh, bottom left of that picture underneath. And you can see that it stretches even all the way northwest, all the way to Greece. Uh, and the reason it kind of stops at Greece is because of Alexander the Great. Um, that Greece was rising to power at this point, too. And so, you know, one of the things you have to know about the Bible in order to understand the Bible, is you got to understand where Israel is. Uh, and of course, Israel on this map is so small that you, I'm sure, cannot see it. Um, in fact, the word Israel is not on there, but I think the word Jerusalem is on there. And so you see Israel is just tiny, right above Egypt to the right. Um, but the reason that Israel was always in the news in from, you know, 9th century B.C., up until about when? Oh, now? Yeah, the reason they're always in the news is because of where they're located. And so you got the powers to the, to the north, Babylon, Assyria. You got the powers to the south, Egypt. You got the powers to the, what would that be, the east, uh, Persia. And you got the powers to the west, Greece. And all of them want to get at each other, and they want access to those trade routes. And so Israel is always right there in the middle. And so that's, that's the context of this story. You have the Medo-Persians ruling, but you got Alexander the Great starting to bear down. Uh, and, and, and so the, the question is, what's going to happen with God's people? Um, what, what, what is he going to do when difficulty arises in yet another foreign context? They've already kind of been through the crisis of faith where they found themselves in Babylon and many of them wondered, are we out of God's jurisdiction? You know, are we so far away from Jerusalem that God can't even see us anymore? He doesn't love us anymore, didn't care about us? Of course, we know why they were in Babylon, right? It's not just because the Babylonians were strong people. Why were they in Babylon? Because God's people were disobedient. God told them way back from the beginning in the book of Exodus, hey, if you will walk with me and obey me, I will bless you and I will leave you in the land, and it will go well for you. But if you disobey me and you're unfaithful to me, uh, you will be removed from the land. And so they weren't just in Babylon because the Babylonians were the powers of the day. God used the powers of the day to discipline his people. Uh, and so now what's, what's going to happen with them when that begins to happen again? Uh, I want to do something odd tonight. And that is, I just want to read you the story. Um, obviously not the whole story, because it's 10 chapters long. I think I would probably run out of time. Uh, but I want to read to you the first two chapters. Um, I think with certain books of the Bible, you just need to sit down and read it in a, in a setting um, and, and kind of get the picture. And I think for some books, and maybe this is just me, but I think for some of them, getting to hear it is even better. Uh, so... I don't know what your habits are, but in, in books like this, if you are never in the habit of reading aloud to yourself, get in the habit of it. Because you will catch stuff having read it out loud that you will not catch when you're just looking at it. Because it slows you down and you hear things that you would not see. Uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you to do something even weirder. Close your Bible. All right? Because you might not have the same translation, but I just want you to listen. Now, we're going to open our Bible up again in just a few minutes, 
and I'm going to point to some specific verses. But I just want you to hear this story. This is an incredibly well-written story, uh, much like the book of Ruth, probably the greatest short story ever written, by the way. Now, in the days of Ahasuerus, by the way, I'm a little, little, little aside before we begin. Some of these names I'm just going to kind of skip over real quickly. I'm not going to struggle through some names when that's not the point. So if you hear a Bob, when it's, you know it's not Bob, just know I'm just trying to save us some heartache and save me some embarrassment. Now, in the days of Xerxes, the Xerxes who reigned from India to Ethiopia, over 127 provinces, in those days when King Xerxes sat on his royal throne in Susa, the capital, in the third year of his reign, he gave a feast for all his officials and servants. The army of Persia and Media and the nobles and governors of the provinces were before him, while he showed the riches of his royal glory and the splendor and pomp of his greatness for many days, 180 days. And when these days were completed, the king gave for all the people present in Susa, the citadel, both great and small, a feast lasting seven days in the court of the garden of the king's palace. There were white cotton curtains and violet hangings fastened with cords of fine linen and purple and silver rods and marble pillars and also couches of gold and silver on a mosaic pavement of porphyry, marble, mother of pearl, and precious stones. Drinks were served in golden vessels, vessels of different kinds, and the royal wine was lavished according to the bounty of the king. And the drinking was according to this edict. There is no compulsion. For the king had given orders to all the staff of the palace to do as each man desired. Queen Vashti also gave a feast for the women in the palace that belonged to King Xerxes. On the seventh day, when the heart of the king was merry with wine, he commanded his seven eunuchs who served in the presence of the king to bring Queen Vashti before the king with her royal crown in order to show the peoples and the princes her beauty, for she was lovely to look at. But Queen Vashti refused to come at the king's command, and at this the king became enraged, and his anger burned within him. Then the king said to the wise men who knew the times, for this was the king's procedure toward all those who were versed in law and judgment. The men next to him were, so on and so forth, the seven princes of Persia and Media, who saw the king's face and first sat in the kingdom, or sat first in the kingdom. And they said, according to the law, what is to be done to Queen Vashti because she has not performed the commands of King Xerxes delivered by the eunuchs? And then one of them, Mimikin, said in the presence of the king and the officials, not only against the king has Vashti done wrong, but also against all the officials and all the peoples who were in all the provinces of King Xerxes. For the queen's behavior will be made to known to all women, causing them to look at their husbands with contempt, since they will say King Xerxes commanded Queen Vashti to be brought before him, and she did not come. This very day, the noble women of Persia and Media who have heard of the queen's behavior will say to all the king's officials, will say the same to all the king's officials, and there will be contempt and wrath and plenty. If it pleases the king... Let a royal order go out from him, and let it be written among the laws of the Persians and the Medes, so that it may not be repealed, that Vashti is never again to come before the king Xerxes. And let the king give her royal position to another who is better than she. So when the decree made by the king is proclaimed throughout all his kingdom, for it is vast, all women will give honor to their husbands, high and low alike. Let me just pause there just for a second. Women, women in the audience, would that make you honor your husband? All right, we'll just continue. This advice, there was, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. This advice pleased the king and the princes, and the king did as Mimikin proposed. He sent letters to all the royal provinces, to every province in its own script, and to every people in its own language, that every man be master in his own household and speak according to the language of his people. After these things, when the anger of King Xerxes had abated, he remembered Vashti and what she had done and what had been decreed against her. 
Then the king's young men who attended him said, Let beautiful young virgins be sought out for the king. And let the king appoint officers in all the provinces of his kingdom to gather all the beautiful young virgins to the harem in Susa, the capital, under custody of Haggai, the king's eunuch, who is in charge of the women, and let their cosmetics be given to them. And let the young woman who pleases the king be queen instead of Vashti. And this pleased the king, and he did so. I think I'm going to stop right there for now because I want to teach for a little bit and see how much time we have. We may not finish all that I have intended. But let's talk about what's going on here. Is this not an incredible story? And it's not a story. This happened. This happened. We are reading about stuff that really happened, and there is so much for us to learn. And so one of the things that we're going to be talking about, and we, we may have to do this over a couple of over a couple of weeks, um, I, I want to speak briefly about this question of descriptive or prescriptive. And I, I don't know if you are familiar enough with those terms to know what I mean by that, but the question is, is everything that we read in the Bible telling us what to do, or is some of the stuff in the Bible just telling us what has been done? in order that we might know what to do. And in this particular book, I think we have a glaring example that much of the Old Testament is descriptive in what it teaches, and the prescriptions are not specified in the text. They come out of the text. And this is a great example. Let me give you another example for that. Uh, it is not uncommon for people who are not big fans of the Bible to say, well, you know, the Bible teaches polygamy. You know, the Bible teaches that it's okay for men to have more than one wife. And when they say that, I'm, I'm inclined to say, can you point me to the passage that it says that it's okay to have more than one wife? And they'll say, well, you know, David had more than one wife, and so-and-so had more than one wife, and Solomon had lots of wives. And my, my response would be, and do you read how that went? You know, do you do you read what happened as a result of those things? Do we, do we have to have in the text, do not do this, in order for us to know, do not do this? Um, you know, in the book of Esther, especially, because God's word, because God's name is not in there, in the book of Esther, we have unusual storytelling in the fact that there's not a lot of narrative comment. There's not it is, not, um, it is not a know-it-all narrative, an all-knowing narrator who will give you an action and then like, for example, the Gospel of John, who will give you this parenthetical comment that says, and he said that because he was really mad. You know, we don't have that in the book of Esther. We just get the action. And we have to figure out, was that a good action or was that a bad action? But you see, I don't think that's a bad thing, because I don't know about you, but in my life, I don't have a narrator who follows me around. I don't have an audible voice that says, watch out for that guy over there. You know, he's saying this, but what he really means is this thing over here. You know, we have to deduce those things. We have to put pieces of the puzzle together and use the discernment that God has given us in order to figure out, is it a good action or is it a bad action? Is this something that God is blessing, or is this just something that it happened that God is teaching us through? So next week when we come back, I'm positive we're not going to finish all this tonight. So next week, we're going to talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly from these two chapters that I think give us some, some narrative clues as to what God likes and what God dislikes. Uh, so I would encourage you to try to pick up on some of those by yourself. But let's just go back through that first chapter and just pick up on, uh, just pick up on a few of these things. I would maybe entitle this first chapter, um, I would ask the question, follow the leader? Like, who, who is leading in this chapter? It is, it is fascinating. When you read through this chapter, who's supposed to be in charge? Who would you think is in charge of this scene? 
you would think Xerxes. Now, why would you think that? Because he is the king. He is King Xerxes. And so you would think, here is the king that is on the throne of the most powerful empire in the known world. Surely he is a strong leader. And you read this chapter, and there's not one piece of evidence that he's leading anybody. I mean, just think about it. In the first several verses, what is he being led by? In verses 1 through um, let's see, what's the cutoff of this one? In verses 1 through 8, what's happening? He's throwing this lavish party. Did you read about what all was being seen? White cotton, linens, gold chalices, gold couches, marble. Why is he doing all that? Because he is showing off. Now, there's more than likely a political and military reason he's showing off. Right around this time, as I said, the Greeks were starting to bear down from the north east, northwest, and his father, King Xerxes' father Darius, had lost a very important battle to the Greeks. In fact, he lost his life fighting the Greeks. So one of the things that's on Xerxes' to-do list is he wants to get rid of the Greeks. He wants to expand his empire. And right around this time, we know that he was preparing to do that. In fact, in 480 B.C., he won a very decisive battle against the Greeks. And in 479 B.C., he lost a very decisive battle to the Greeks. And so many commentators think that this this six-month-long feast. I mean, don't, don't miss that. Don't just read over that number. We, we are inclined to reading over names and numbers and geographical landmarks, but don't miss the fact this party lasted six months. So it was a seven-day party at the end of a six-month party. Most people think the six-month party was all of his military officials being gathered into Susa and that he was trying to convince them, I've got the goods to fight this battle. Yes, it's going to be expensive, but we can handle it. Let's get our plans together. And so it was probably part planning and part partying. And then at the end, he's probably trying to make his final pitch. And all of this, in my opinion, in the first eight verses especially, he is being led by pride and by power. He is letting those two things in his life dictate what he's going to do. He's being led by pride. Now, that one's not the most important one. How about in verses 10 to 12? What's he being led by in verses 10 to 12? He is being led by alcohol in verses 10 to 12. That's, that is pretty obvious in verse 10 when it says, on the seventh day when the, when the heart of the king was merry with wine. As I said, this book doesn't have a lot of narrative comments like that. So when when one of them is thrown in there, it better get your attention. The narrator is telling us, huh, this is really important, and you need to see everything that he's about to do through the lens of what I just said. His heart was merry with wine. Uh, now, keep in mind, the Bible tells us that is not a good idea for anybody, but especially for the king. Proverbs 31 says it is not for kings to drink wine, or for rulers to take strong drink, lest they drink and forget what has been decreed and pervert the rights of all the afflicted. With great leadership comes great responsibility. And he was not being led by his military prowess or by his discernment. He was being led by alcohol. And it says here, uh, here how about this for irony? I couldn't help but, get, but, but take note of this verse. The other, the, the other principle I would tell you in reading passages like this and stories like this is when a, when a verse seems so odd that you're just like, what? You've got to ask yourself, why is that in there? Why is that detail preserved for me? So we're, 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 we're reading about this party. We're reading about the alcohol. We know that his heart is merry with wine. And all of a sudden it says, and drinking was according to this edict. There is no compulsion. 
For the king had given orders to all the staff of his palace to do as each man desired. Translation, okay, it sounds terrible, but it actually is supposed to sound gracious. It is supposed to be Xerxes saying, hey, I'm doing this and we're doing this, but if you don't want to do this, that's cool. You know, you don't have to. You just do what you want to do. Now, why is that so ironic? Because it's exactly the opposite of what he does with his wife. He is trying to give the men all this freedom. I don't want to impose anything on you, but he does exactly the opposite with his wife. He is imposing on his wife. In fact, look at verse, this is another verse that grabbed my attention. Look at verse, well, still at verse 10, actually. On the seventh day, when the heart of the king was merry with wine, he commanded Mehuman, Bistha, Har- Harbona, Bigtha, and Abagtha, Zethar, and Carcass, the seven eunuchs who served in the presence of the king Xerxes, to bring Queen Vashti before the king in her royal crown. Now, what is it about that verse that is so intriguing? What? Why did it take so many people? If he wanted Vashti to come, would not one of the eunuchs have sufficed to deliver the message? So why, why not just one? Why seven? Because once again, he's being led by pride and power and alcohol. And he does not want Queen Vashti to miss the message. You better get here because I want you to get here so he's being led by alcohol how about in verses 13 through 22 who's leading he is peer pressure led did you notice that King Xerxes makes no decisions for himself he has all these people around him saying if it pleases the king I think you ought to do this, king. I think you ought to do this other thing. He's got all these princes who are supposed to be under him, but really they're over him. They're they're telling him what to do. And the really funny part is, at the beginning of chapter 2, it's not just the higher-ups that are telling him what to do, it's the lower downs. The young men, like the guys that are just his, basically his servants, they're telling him, hey, I got an idea for what you should do. So he is not leading anything. He is being peer pressure led. And then along with that, he is being led by the lust of the eyes. Uh, This is more in the the beginning of chapter 2 than it is, I think the verses are wrong there. So that should be the beginning of chapter 2. Listen to this quote. Uh, And it's interesting what gets us to this quote. It says that he basically disposed of Queen Vashti. And in this book, it says he issued a royal decree, and the, the royal decree was permanent. You know, once you, once you issued that decree, you could not change your mind. But if you look at verse, look at the first verse of chapter 2. After these things, when the anger of King Xerxes had abated, he remembered Vashti. I think that's kind of a euphemism by the way. What is that saying? After he had been away for a few days, he was like, what have I done? I want Vashti to come to me. But nope, because he was led by alcohol and power and pride and his his peers. And so now the lower downs have some advice. The lower downs say, let beautiful young virgins be sought out for the king and let their cosmetics be given to them. Translation, king, there are lots of really beautiful women, and we can make them even more beautiful. And so they're just feeding him all this stuff that is leading him in the wrong direction, which I think forces us to ask ourselves, by what or by whom are we being led? I was listening to a sermon on Esther by Mark Dever, uh, the, the pastor at Capitol Hill Baptist. 
and he was talking about a different portion of the book, but he said, be very careful when you begin to hate the sin of somebody in the Bible. Because you have to remember that as bad as you feel about their sin, God feels even worse about your sin. Not saying that your sin is worse than their sin, but you couldn't possibly dislike their sin as much as God dislikes your sin. So when we're looking at King Xerxes and we're talking about how this guy that should be, he should be leading, but instead he's following, we have to remember, now we shouldn't be leading anything, but we should be following well. And so it causes us to ask, who are we following? Who's leading us? Because what's the constant battle within us? Desires of the flesh, pride, alcohol, lust of the eyes, popularity, money, all those things that he was dealing with, we deal with those things too. Desires of the flesh or the Holy Spirit within us. And that's why Paul says, if we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. That means follow his lead. It's, a, it's an interesting picture the Bible gives us. It is a great reminder. The Holy Spirit does not lasso us and say, by golly, you are coming with me whether you like it or not. No, he doesn't do that. He is, he is the quiet person of the Trinity. And he's trying to lead us, but he's not going to force us. God is in control, but he does not control us like we are remote control. And so it, when we want to ignore the Holy Spirit, he's ignored. And because he is a person, because he is a living being, not only is he ignored, but he's grieved about that. And just like you would be if you're leading your child and they're not listening, or you're leading an employee and they're not listening, and eventually you say, okay, I guess I won't lead you in that area. I'll, I'll, I'll leave you to your own mistakes. You'll figure them out. So who are we following? Are we willing to just do anything controlled by whatever? You know, you fill in the blank. Xerxes had all his issues, but we got all our issues too. Or are we going to recognize that we have a good, good Heavenly Father who's trying to lead us well down the right path? That's what the whole book of Proverbs is about. He's trying to lead us well, but he won't force us to go there. Who are we going to follow? Isn't it a great story? It's a great story about a merciful, faithful God, even if he is unnamed, he is definitely not absent from this story, and he's not absent from your story either. Keep that in mind. Many of these Jewish people didn't really remember God's role in their life. Last little tidbit, because I, I think it leads toward application. This is really the first period of time that God's people were called the Jews and not the Israelites. Uh, for all throughout the early parts of the Bible, they're called the Israelites, and now they start to be called the Jews. I think it's interesting because for us, when we hear Israelite, we kind of think place because Israel. And when we hear Jews, we kind of think people because they are the Jews. But it's just the opposite. The name Israelite is based on a person. Israel, who was... Jacob. So they are the descendants of Jacob. They are, they are the followers after a person. And the word Jew, which sounds like a people name to us, was really a place name because they were from Judah. So they were the people of Judah. So in this portion of time in history, they cease to be named after a person and they're named instead after a place. And we must be very careful that we too are not known for the person that we follow, but for the place that we assemble. We follow Jesus. We are followers of Jesus. We are not, we are not Utica Baptist Church, 4056 Wells Highway. Let us live our lives in such a way that we point people to a person and not just remind people of a campus. Let's pray together.